Good morning, everyone. Uh, why don't we get started? Uh, my name is Eric Gilbert, a member of the Laterno Conservation uh, Steering Committee, as well as Manager Development Committee for the County of Oxford. On behalf of the Committee, Conservation Ontario and University of Guelph, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Fall uh, 2023 Laterno Webinar Series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Tilsonburg, where I am uh, president located, is situated on the traditional territory of Indigenous peoples dating back countless generations. I acknowledge the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and Attawadaran peoples, uh, showing respect for the long-standing relationships that Indigenous nations have to this land as they're the original caretakers. Uh, this webinar will highlight that development pressures along our shorelines are increasing and the stressors that our water bodies are experiencing from development, climate change, and leg legislative changes are increasing. This webinar will, prevent, will uh, present positive steps that we can take to improve resiliency and quality of our shorelines and to promote sustainable development along waterfront lands. This morning's webinar will be split into two parts. Uh, for part one, our three speakers will be presenting and highlighting a free policy toolkit created by Watersheds Canada and associated strategies for implementation of this toolkit to achieve environmental net, net gain at the waterfront. After these presentations, we'll have a special announcement from Watersheds Canada. And after this, we'll be inviting all the speakers back for a panel discussion where we will ask uh, a few prepared questions, as well as the ones from the, from the participants in the Q&A box uh, in the webinar. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, first of all, all of our attendees are muted and you'll not be able to speak or come on video. You will find a Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen at any time during the webinar. I encourage you to type in your question in the box and press enter to have it posted. You may direct your questions at, indiv at individual presenters or the panel as a whole. You're also able to upvote a question that you like by pressing the thumbs up. We will be reviewing the questions and we'll have time to pose some of them to the panelists during the discussion and feel free to interact with others uh, in the webinar through the chat box. Uh, this webinar is also being recorded uh, so that those who were not able to attend will be able to listen in when they can. And before I introduce the panelists, let's look at the results of our poll. Uh, so first question, uh, what part of the province do you reside? We have a good mix of people from uh, Southwestern Ontario, GTA, Central Ontario, and Eastern Ontario, as well with some from uh, Northern and outside of Ontario. Affiliation, we have lots of CA folks here, uh, municipal uh, folks, NGOs, provincial and federal ministries, students, academics, and consultant. It's a really great, uh, really great cross section. And for the top barriers to shoreline protection, folks identified competing interests, environmental concerns versus economic concerns, lack of government guidance, insufficient scientific knowledge, uh, availability of best practice resources, not enough volunteers, community engagement, and all of the above. Our first speaker is Robert Pye from Watersheds Canada. Uh, Robert is Executive Director of Watersheds Canada and has over 25 years of experience in fish and wildlife conservation and his two decades from 1998 to 2022 with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. He founded the national award-winning program uh, Get Outdoors Youth at Leadership Program. He led OFAH Communications on internationally headlined outdoor issues and provided membership services for hundreds of conservation volunteer groups. Robert came to Watersheds Canada to take his vision for conservation teams, programs, and partnerships to a new level. Welcome, Robert, and I'll turn it over to you. Hey, good morning, Eric. Thank you, and, and welcome, everybody. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm just overwhelmed, pleased and overwhelmed with the, uh, the response to this webinar. The attendance is great, and... Uh, it's just uh, very flattering and and very encouraging uh, to uh, have everybody's strong interest in the subject today. So thank you for uh, attending this Watersheds Canada webinar to learn about how we view a community approach to freshwater protection. 
And um, if, um, I can't see it, but I'm sure that my slide is showing now. Oh, there it is. Thanks. Thank you to the, the team for helping me as I can just go through my presentation and not have to worry about the PowerPoint. Yeah, so our, uh, our, our presentation is around uh, building resilient shorelands and um, our approach, community approach to freshwater protection. Uh, well, it kind of looks like what you're seeing here in the first slide. Now imagine if every lake you enjoy spending time on had a shoreland that was so natural and resilient. Today's webinar is all about how we work at the grassroots level, uh, as well as the municipal level to balance an, an active waterfront living with a commitment to shoreland protection. Now, for some, that may sound like an oxymoron, but wait until you hear from my colleague, Chantel, and our great volunteer, Janet, as they provide a, a full tour of our toolkits, apps, and programs, as well as a real life case study about, a, uh, uh, about local stewardship in action. And as Eric mentioned, at the end of our presentations, we have a special announcement that may provide even more inspiration to get your local group or one that you know of started along the stewardship path. Mobilizing stewardship action is what Watersheds Canada is all about. We are a national charity with a team of 10, including myself and our next presenter, Chantel. We have dedicated staff, volunteers, partners, donors and funders. And I'm particularly proud to mention our great working relationship with many conservation authorities. We thank Conservation Ontario for welcoming Watersheds Canada to your Laternal Conservation Symposium um, held last month. And our uh, one of our colleagues participated in that uh, great event, as well as um, uh, the webinar series branded by the same name, Conservation um, Ontario's Laternal Conservation Symposium. And we're delighted to be here. So now that I have you staring at this slide long enough, I, I know what you're thinking, or at least know what I would be thinking. Um, as I look into that uh, great uh, shoreline, that great lake, I would think, uh, well, where where am I gonna where am I gonna go fishing first, <laughs> and where would I like to build my dream cottage? Next slide, please. So let's call it the Canadian dream. When boomers were just babies, their parents found backwood shores to build a tiny cottage, like the one you see there on the left. Their dream was nothing more than a summer weekend escape with more nature than neighbors. Morning coffee by the shore with the backdrop of an A-frame cottage and an outhouse. What a pleasant place to sit. Now I did say sit. Fishing, swimming, connecting with nature and bonding with family all happen here. The natural shore has always drawn people uh, to the water, so why would anyone want to wash it away with unsustainable development? Also, we now count on resilient shorelands in the wake of climate change. The early years of cottage life also founded a land ethic that shaped a generational commitment to freshwater protection. Ratepayers or property owner organizations are also referred to as cottage or conservation associations were in my opinion, the first to raise the flag on the need for shoreline restoration and naturalization. They wanted to do more than just spend time in the lake. They wanted everyone to take an active stewardship role. And I don't think uh, lake associations really get enough credit for how hard they work uh, it goes beyond just hosting regattas and social events. They work really hard in rallying the entire lake community around environmental issues. So in the words of Aldo Leopold, that land is a community is a basic concept of biology, but that land is loved and respected is an extension of ethics. The cottage culture is still going strong but it's surrounded today by people who wish to make the shoreland their permanent home. Next slide, please. It, it kind of seemed like overnight or perhaps even over COVID that the lakeside two bedroom home was replaced by three stories. These days, the traditional cottage is not a home without HVAC and Wi-Fi. 
And that progress is fine, so long as having full amenities also means having a full understanding of how to achieve environmental net gain at the waterfront. Rural lakes and rivers must be protected by a natural shoreland. Watersheds Canada launched a program called Planning for Our Shoreland. The logo is there on the left. And it was developed following a needs assessment of 200 municipal planners, councillors, and lake and river associations. We also surveyed bylaws in over 50 municipalities. And we found that there was a need to bridge the gap between environmental concerns and economic needs. And I was pleased to see that so many people agree uh, based on the survey to start this webinar. So the Planning for Our Shorelands program is a collaborative that is driven by a steering committee. And that steering committee, I should mention, includes Cataraqui Conservation, the Federation of Ontario Cottagers Associations, the land between, as well as planners and lake residents. And one of the lake residents is in fact one of our panelists today. And in the face of increased uh, development pressures, the Planning for Our Shorelands uh, program tackled the top barriers to shoreline protection, namely a lack of availability to the kind of resources and tools that we will be sharing with you today. Next slide, please. Watersheds Canada is also pleased to share our toolkits and expertise in helping conservation volunteers and lake associations to create more fish habitat. And we won't be getting into these kind of great projects today, but it's important to let you know that our work supports in water as well as on shore. Our fish habitat program, by the way, has carried out 26 fisheries projects that include spawning bed restoration for walleye and brook trout. But I put these photos in here to remind us that grassroots volunteer engagement still exists. So when we're out there promoting the science of buffers and talking about municipal policy, we need to remember that our knowledge and resources can also harness volunteer action in ways that our tax dollars could never afford. Waterfront residents want to volunteer for conservation. They just need our support. Next slide, please. It was a year ago today uh, that Ontario was experiencing the biggest environmental rally cry of all time. Watersheds Canada did our part in speaking out against the proposed elimination of site plan control. And we also stood up for the great role of conservation authorities in terms of uh, providing local knowledge and oversight. And in response to the More Homes Built Faster Act, Watersheds Canada generated over 5,000 opposition letters that were sent to MPPs across Ontario. And we also submitted our concerns to the Ontario Standing Committee. But in the past year, Watersheds Canada has appeared before a number of councils with a professional delegation that speaks to the need to protect shorelands and an opportunity to help educate municipal decision makers and staff. We are an organization that is passionate about freshwater protection and we are tenacious about letting government at all levels know how hard our volunteers and partners, including conservation authorities, are working to save our shorelands from unsustainable development and the impacts of climate change. So it's time now to open up the Watersheds Canada toolkits that have been viewed and downloaded by thousands of people, but never before uh, have we presented these toolkits in such an interactive uh, panel presentation that will now be led by my colleague, Chantal. Thanks, Robert, for your presentation, providing the context for the next part of the discussion. Our next presenter is Chantal Lefebvre. Chantal is a Natural Edge Regional Coordinator for Watersheds Canada and is an accomplished professional who's earned an advanced diploma in rental technology from Fleming College followed by a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science from Trent University. She has worked with various levels of government, conservation authorities, and the private environmental sector. In her current role as Natural Edge Regional Coordinator, she leverages Natural Edge, the Natural Edge app, uh, application and other resources to engage with waterfront property owners, facilitating the restoration of shorelines using native plants. 
I'll turn it over to you, Chantel. Thanks, Eric. Good morning, everybody. We'll just wait till my slides are up. Perfect. So as Eric mentioned, I'm the regional coordinator for the Natural Edge program, which is probably one of our biggest programs here at Watersheds Canada. Uh, so we like to what we call restore the ribbon of life, which is that uh, shoreland riparian area zone. Next slide, please. Um, so why did we do this project? I remember when I started this position, I dove into all the scientific uh, research and papers that we have saved up around this. It was just had an eye-opening experience about how, what a, shore, a vegetated shoreland buffer can do for us. I thought I had a good idea of it. And then once I started diving into the science, it was quite amazing as this decades worth of research out there about how they can support a healthy water ecosystems. Uh, one of the main things they do is they can buffer out harmful pollutants, such as those excess nutrients from farmland or uh, just general runoff, some road salt. They can all kind of buffer that stuff before it enters our, our waterways. Um, they do a fantastic job at mitigating erosion as the powerful woody root systems can hold all that soil together. So when we have flooding events or a high wake action, they can help hold that soil together, um, reducing that erosion potential. They also have provided tons of food and shelter for wildlife, including many species at risk. Um, they provide uh, berries on the multiple different shrubs that can be found present on a riparian area. They uh, provide, uh, you know, wood for our beavers and then nesting areas for things such as loons and um, and then amphibians as well. So it's 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 a very happy, healthy place for habitat for our wildlife. Um, they have considerate beauty and economic value to waterfront properties. And Robert mentioned that's kind of the ideal look of a lake is just full of uh, various plants and trees and wildlife. And that's what draws our, our ourselves to these areas to build our homes and our cottages there is that beauty. And they help protect our freshwater ecosystems against the impact of climate change. Um, you know, we're getting more severe storms, uh, droughts, um, and then more flooding events as well. So they all kind of help protect against those uh, new impacts from climate change. Next slide, please. Um, because of all that buffering capacity they have that I mentioned, they really help protect our water quality and protect against eutrophication of our lakes. Um, they reduce our runoff by over 40% um, when we compared to having a non-vegetated shoreline, as you can see the graphic there. Um, that is because the root systems go a lot deeper into the soil and help kind of create a, a, a highway for that water to infiltrate down into the water compared to a, just a manicured lawn that kind of acts almost as a slip and slide of water into our lakes, um, carrying all those harmful pollutants uh, with them. Next slide, please. So here's one of our graphics from our toolkit. It's the resilient shorelines graphic. It kind of depicts what you know, the ideal, healthy, uh, developed shoreland can look like. We have our upland zone, which has our more terrestrial plants, not our very super love water loving plants. And that was ideally where any development would happen far away from our actual shoreline itself, as far up the shoreland as we call it as possible. And then we move into the riparian zone, which is that, that scientific name for that kind of transfer zone between aquatic ecosystem to terrestrial upland ecosystem. Um, so those, you'll find plants there that like can handle that flooding impact, can soak up that extra water when we have that flood and can handle those ups and downs of water levels throughout the year, which is natural. Um, and then we move on to the actual shoreline itself, which is that distinct line between the water and land. So that's why we kind of changed our wording from shoreline to shoreland. As many people, when you say a shoreline, it's that actual distinct line compared to we want to see it more as a bigger uh, aspect as it's a shoreland. It's the entire area leading up until that, that actual shoreline itself. Um, and then you move into the littoral zone, which is the area of water the sun can penetrate to the bottom of. And that's your most active zone in a lake ecosystem. That's where all your plants going to survive. That's where all your benthic invertebrates and young fish need to have for habitat. So that mix between riparian to littoral zone is very important. As said, that 90% of all aquatic life uses that 
shoreline riparian zone as well as 70 percent of terrestrial life need that at some point in time in their life cycle so it's a very important zone that shoreland area um for many uh life forms next slide please uh, so robert mentioned environmental net gains so i just showed you an example of an ideal developed shoreline you know all that vegetation is left you have a single path down to your waterway with a, a dock in place and your home is or cottage is situated far away from the shoreline itself. That has not always happened and historically development has happened very close to the shoreline. A lot of times it is to get that best view or be as close to nature as possible. Um, but somewhere along the line that uh, nature has been removed from that, that area where we've developed to have more lawn manicured areas and have as much access to the water as we can as you know we love to access the water and that's why we are living or cottaging there to begin with so that's where environmental net gain can come in handy you know development happened decades ago and uh now we can improve upon that so environmental net gain is the approach to ensure that development or redevelopment of a property leaves the natural environment in an immeasurably improved state compared to prior conditions um, so that's trying to make it better than what it was before. So if you're adding on a new addition to your house, for instance, um, this graphic demonstrates, you know, adding it to the back of your property. That property, that that new development is going to also take up more per permeable surface. So less water is going to be able to enter our groundwater. So then perhaps making your drive very permeable so that more water can enter there since you're taking away from another option can help balance out that impact. Um, Another great way of achieving environmental net gain is having that vegetated riparian zone, as it's, I've described the importance of that as well. Uh, so there's many very various options to achieve environmental net gain, and that can be used in a way to sustainably develop our shorelines or redevelop them now that some of those cottages are getting older and need some uptake as a way to have less negative impact, but still be able to appreciate and utilize those uh, waterfront properties that we've come to love as a community. Next slide, please. So I've talked about a lot of vegetated buffers, how they can achieve environmental gain and the, the grand importance of having a vegetated buffer in so many different aspects. Um, so a lot of that has been destroyed already. So how can we get back to that? So another part of our toolkit is the guide to preparing a, a shoreline naturalization plan. So it can walk you through as a shoreline property owner, it's designed for them themselves um, to draw up your planting plan area, assess planting conditions and choose plants and kind of map that out and provide uh, options of plants as well um, to really design your own naturalization planting plan uh, to achieve all the benefits I outlined as, as a vegetated shoreline. Um, it's available on our website, um, but we also have, so if that's, an option for you and that's something you'd like to take on um, that's great but we also have lots of different planting programs options out there so one of those being the Watersheds Canada Natural Edge program which I'll get into a bit more shortly. Many local conservation authorities also have uh, shoreline restoration programs that are accessible as well as some municipalities have uh, available tools for you as well. Next slide please. So the Natural Edge program, we deliver it in throughout kind of Western, Eastern Ontario is our delivery area, but we work with multiple partners all across the country and they're continuing to expand the program to deliver this Natural Edge program to help landowners who are interested in it in restoring the shoreline and, and taking advantage of all those benefits a vegetated shoreline can have since that or development has already occurred, we can restore back, to, we can restore that ribbon of life. So it empowers landowners, municipalities, and organizations and provides them the tools and technology needed to restore those shorelines. Next slide, please. So how it works is uh, Watersheds Canada developed and, and piloted the program in Eastern Ontario. As I say, that's we still uh, develop and uh, promote the project in that area and continue to uh, plant native trees in our area and shrubs in our area. We did about uh, 10,000 uh, trees, shrubs, and wildflowers this year alone in our delivery area, not to mention other delivery partners. So that's where 
the Natural Edge program is very special, is that we could easily be shared with different organizations across Canada um, so that we can all participate in this. So it, it has tools and technology, training, and ongoing support from Watersheds Canada. So I'll get into those tools in the next slide, please. So our biggest tool and the one I love the most is the Natural Edge app. It was developed over many years to kind of become the best thing and easiest thing to tool to use to share with our with our landowners and other organizations using the program. So I kind of think of it as like a little bit of a video game actually, where you can uh, take pictures of your shoreland um, and kind of map out where all those native species you want are going to be. And it really helps at, uh, be able to educate and uh, describe what the shoreline may look like once it's restored to those property owners that may be hesitant on uh, restoring the property. I find a lot of property owners know the benefits of a natural shoreline and know that that manicured lawn may not be the best option anymore. And that's just, you know, what their, their grandparents and great grandparents did on their property and know we can do better things. And they just don't know how, and they don't know what plants to use, how it's going to look. And that's where this program can come in handy is it completely outlines exactly what plants to use based on the, the site conditions, such as soil and sunlight and moisture level. Um, and then outlines where those plants should be planted for them. Um, it's connected to our native plant database, which is a Canada-wide database of native plants um, with all different growing conditions listed on them and what they're gonna look like. So when you take a picture and you put it in those soil conditions, the app can actually recommend plants that would do best in those conditions. So, you know, you don't need five years education and a passion of plants and water ecology like myself to actually restore shorelines or this app can help you through this. So it can be useful for people who may not have a giant knowledge base on how we're storing shorelines um, and to communicate that to those landowners. Next slide, please. The other tools involved with the Natural Edge program is some more educational stuff, such as our shoreline habitat creation manual and our native plant care guide, which are given to our shoreline property owners that have participated in the program, but are also available for free on our website for anyone interested in creating habitat or learning more about wildflowers that are native to their area. Um, it provides education about each species and how to take care of them. And uh, the importance of them as well is uh, pollinators such as wildflowers, need, pollinators need wildflowers um, for their life system. Next slide, please. So the program works. So if you're interested in being a, a program delivery partner, it starts with a site visit. So that's where the delivery partner or myself would go out to take pictures and measurements and talk with the landowner to discuss what kind of restoration they project they want. This is also a fantastic time to talk about anything else about shoreland living, you know, um, any runoff potential from the roadway or from their septic system that comes up a lot in top of conversation. So it's a really fantastic opportunity to just have a time to talk with a landowner and then that knowledge gets expanded to their neighbors. So it's a really great way to get information out there through that site visit. After that site visit is completed, we go on to creating the planting plan using the app, really easy to do and share that knowledge with the landowner and they can actually then go out and look at their property and go, oh, this is what that's going to look like and that's going to look fantastic. I can definitely participate in this program and do better for my lake. And the next step is, uh, is the fun part, planting. Uh, so they can, uh, the program differs uh, from area, for, um, but it, they can pick up their plants uh, to plant their shoreline and they're all sourced through the program. Um, which is another big barrier to people participating in uh, shoreline restoration as, you know, native plants can be hard to find. Um, you go to, uh, you know, the Canadian Tire down the street and most of the plants there will not be native species and some may even still be invasive species. Um, again, people may not have the education base needed to determine what species should be used there. So sourcing the plants and, and educating them and telling what plants will work best is uh, really valuable to them. And I have landowners being very thankful that they have this knowledge now and they can share it with their community members as well. Uh, that is it for me. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Chantel, for sharing the tools that Watershed Canada has developed uh, to improve uh, our resil resiliency along shorelines. Our final speaker today is Janet Taylor. Uh, Janet has volunteered for uh, 15 years on several projects with Watersheds Canada. Most recently, it's planning for our shorelines program. Uh, Janet has a master's of science in biochemistry from the University of Toronto. She retired from the federal government in 2002, uh, where she spent more than 30 years working on regulating pesticides, an area that's highly dependent on interpreting scientific data and the subsequent use and regulatory decision making. In 1996, Janet and her late husband, Doug Smith, acquired a property on White Lake in Lanark County in Ontario. Around 2013, algae blooms started to appear on White Lake, which sparked an interest in the causes of the blooms. An initiative to study the chemistry of the lake, as well as the density of development and other features in the lake, was done in association with Watersheds Canada. And through this initiative, Janet became interested in the impact of development of various kinds on the qual uh, quality of water in Ontario's freshwater lakes. Janet helps Watersheds Canada and its partners better understand science's role in bridging the gap between policy and individual planning decisions. And thank you, Janet, for joining us today. Over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, let's wait for my first slide to come up. Okay, so this is called Lessons from the Lake, but it's really lessons that I learned. It's not that I feel like I'm teaching anyone. Um, and when my husband and I um, first bought our piece of uh, land on a lake, um, this is why we wanted it. Um, we were windsurfers and we wanted the best possible windsurfing locally. I had spent 30 years with the federal gov government working in pesticide regulation, and I didn't intend to spend any of my downtime uh, debating uh, regulations or interpretations of scientific data. And as far as I was concerned, this is what water was for. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So this happened in 2014, and this changed everything for me. Uh, we had this very substantial lake-wide algae bloom. Uh, it was identified as anabena, very high levels of toxins, well beyond what is um, allowable for drinking water or even for recreation. Could I have the next slide, please? To, to just uh, set the scene a little bit, um, the lake is large, it's shallow, it has a low turnover rate, it has a very long shoreline and a lot of water of, um, of wetland, and it's definitely not your classic um, deep trout water lake, um, or deep water trout lake, sorry. Um, it's within two counties, uh, it's a, it has four municipalities, um, each with their own official plans and sets of bylaws and it's not within a conservation authority. Mm -hmm. So these are some shots of what we dealt with over the years. That was the second year of a zebra mussel infestation. And there is a filament of screen algae. I think it's um, on a Eurasian milfoil um, in that picture. Um, so um, at the start, can I have the next slide please? At the start, um, we founded a small group to study the lake. We were three scientists, a chemist, uh, myself, and uh, a dentist, my husband. Um, so we, we concentrated on the science and on observation. Um, the chemistry of the lake, we um, got involved very early on with the Lake Partner Program of MOE. And because the lake is not a shield lake, uh, we were allowed to sample monthly um, in a couple of locations on the lake. And over the years, um, we were able to expand um, the location. So we ended up with possibly around eight locations on the lake sampled um, monthly uh, during the ice free season, which is a very uh, ambitious program that's been carried on um, over the years. Um, we started to track the blooms and um, to document them, where they occurred, the extent of them, the identification. And this is work that's also still going on. And the biology, we spent a lot of time on the invasive species, the zebra mussels showing up in numbers, Eurasian milfoil and Phragmites. And unfortunately there is um, much more of a list. On the whole, uh, this work out in the field on the lake is interesting and it's fun. And you really feel like you're accomplishing something. Um, for the most part, it's not controversial and what I then found was that you have all of this wonderful information and data observations, What, where do you take it? 
we decided we needed to start an outreach and information program. We first tried to engage the um, the one existing lake organization, which unfortunately at that time and still I think represents only one of the townships on the lake. And, and at that time, we're not interested in pursuing the science as much as we were and um, and not advocating with the, the townships on behalf of the lake. So we decided we needed a lake-wide organization. Um, we designed a survey that we wanted to send out and to get the uh, to get the addresses and where to send these things, we had to go to the tax records of the four townships and spend time collecting mailing addresses of every property owner. And I'm just telling you this because to let you know how much intensive work this can be. So the first survey that we put out, it focused on what the landowners and, and residents felt would be the most valuable uh, features of the lake for them. And we got a great response on that survey. Um, we then held some large open meetings, as you see here. Um, we also had good attendance at those. And we also found that the uh, conversation was always best when you provided food. Um, the priorities that were identified as a result of the survey were these, and I don't think any of the audience will be surprised to see this list, water quality far above the rest in terms of priority. But natural shorelines, um, wildlife habitat, nesting areas, wetlands, forests, um, healthy fish populations and the fishing, these were all in the top, I would say seven or eight. And this seems to be typical of most of the uh, surveys I've seen of lake inhabitants. Next slide. So we got into lake planning, which also is a large project. We embarked on a state of the lake report. We set up a steering committee and we drafted a state of the lake report. Um, the steering committee had broad representation from the lake and from Ministry of Natural Resources and the Conservation Authority and also watersheds participated. Um, it was intended to bring community together. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the four municipalities did not respond positively to our invitation to be a part of it. Um, and one of my biggest regrets on this whole initiative, because we did spend so much time and work on it, was that we never got as far as a lake-wide consultation followed by a lake plan. Um, ironically, one of the townships involved has recently indicated intention to include lake plans in their official plans. Um, I really don't know how that impacts uh, decisions on development. Uh, and that's one thing I, I would really like to follow up, but those townships that do have uh, lake plans included generally in their official plan, uh, has that made a difference in, in how decisions are made on development? Um, I know that they they sometimes appear in lake plans for for uh, trout lakes, um, and uh, whether or not they're they're used effectively, I don't know. Um, all of this activity um, did create some um, fear amongst the, the uh, for developers. Um, they uh, um, one developer did become concerned about property values as we started to document the blooms. And in an open letter, invited members of the lake organization to sue me personally. Um, we um, had fears about increased restrictions on development and that sort of thing. But by and large, I think this this was a, a positive uh, initiative, and <clears throat> it did lead to um, a very very comprehensive description of the lake. Um, can I have the next slide? So this was these community projects uh, were one of the most rewarding of all the things that I feel that we did on the lake. Um, this is where you get people together, generally outside, to do something. And so we had a spawning bed enhancement program, which was mentioned earlier. And this one brought out the businesses on the lake to participate. So we had local contractors, we had the resorts and trailer parks, and we had a lot of just cottage owners. Um, and actually that one seems to have been very successful as, uh, as evidenced in the Ontario Broad Scale Fisheries Monitoring Program that show, showed an increase in the walleye populations in subsequent years. We had a bio blitz, which is pictured there on the right-hand side at the top, and that was 24 hour uh, period of time for naturalists. 
to come out and find and identify as many species as possible in a defined area on the lake. And there was also opportunity for the public to participate. And then we had a lot of um, presentations. So we had the Ontario Federation of Anglers and um, um, Hunters, and they um, did a fabulous uh, presentation on invasive species. Uh, we had the land between and we had planting with the natural edge as you just heard about picture down at the bottom on the right there and as i mentioned at the start these these were all all successful they were all fun um it seems that getting people outdoors and interacting is a way to really help build relationships can i have next this slide please Okay, we tackled the official plans and bylaws. We did what I called the political route first. We um, attended township meetings. We presented the facts, what we thought were the facts to the townships. So we talked about the seriousness and the frequency of the blooms. We talked about the chemistry and the high levels of total phosphorus. And we talked about the most likely sources of phosphorus in the lake which was run off from development. Um, and what we expected from the townships, well, we thought might factor the science into some of their planning decisions and consider more seriously the mitigating measures for controlling pollution in the lake. In fact, what we really wanted was for the townships to observe the most, for the most part, their own P's and, um, official plans and bylaws in terms of buffers and setbacks. And right there on this slide, you'll see a diagram taken out of one set of bylaws and it does show a 30 meter set uh, setback and a 15 meter buffer and a limited access to the lake. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, doesn't, it doesn't show a boat launch, which is very common now. Um, so I, I guess we were looking for, for this kind of approach. However, what we found in our experiences was that legislation does say the right things quite frequently, but is fairly easily short circuited. And much of the current development on the lake is redevelopment and falls under provisions uh, which are entitled legally non-complying, non-conforming. My understanding of these provisions uh, was that they were originally seen as a way to allow owners of an old structure or a cabin close to the water to repair or replace it on the same site using the same footprint. Many bylaws no longer adhere to the same footprint principle and are very broadly interpreted, allowing much larger buildings on the same site as an old building close to the water was. And that, this happens even where the building is being completely demolished. <clears throat> the um, second thing that we face is total land clearing on a virgin site. So on a site where there's all the original forest and um, native plants, the, the site can be cleared right to the water's edge. And this is legal if done before an application for a building permit is submitted. It took me a long time to catch on to this loophole. It's well known to developers. Um, I recently explored with a planner whether or not there is a way around it, and I was told that there is not. And any of you from the Ottawa area may have noticed on the news yesterday an uproar about a large lot on the Ottawa River. It was very heavily wooded, surrounded by wooded lots, um, and it was stripped and a lot of fill brought in. Um, and it was on the news because the neighbors were really upset about it. And the response of the of Ottawa, the city of Ottawa, was that there's nothing that they can do about that and that it is perfectly legal. So that is one thing, these are the two things that I find the parts of legislation that are the hardest to get around, if not impossible. Um, so it does seem to be that we need to um, work with a lot more with environmental net gain, as mentioned in the, uh, the previous speaker. And we need to educate landowners. Um, and especially it's critical to do it before they start to develop. So at purchase or um, as soon as as soon as we know what's going on, but obviously it has to be before they apply for a building permit. Um, so as, as far as um, the legal legal route goes, it's it's um, it's tough. <laughs> we we started a legal route uh, at. at with our group. So we, we started reviewing and commenting on, on applications for development. 
Um, we found that this was pretty tough too. There's a very short time allowed between uh, when a township um, publishes the application and the time for comments. We found frequently needed to get into township offices to get the information. There was a reluctance to share all the information. Um, this has been my experience, although I do think that there are townships that are much more open about the plans for development. Um, then I certainly hope that's the case. Um, next, next slide. Uh, so, this was a <laughs> what I learned about about fighting development with science, um, and this was participation in a Ontario Municipal Board hearing, um, which preceded the local planning appeal tribunals of today. I was involved with one of them, and I, I just have to say up front that if anyone is attempted to go this route based on a, have a hearing based on science, I would suggest not not doing it. Um, what we were dealing with was a proposal for a trailer park expansion. Um, these were park model trailers, about 200, which I consider to be somewhat akin to seasonal cottages. They wanted to pack them into the site of an old um, travel trailer park where there were currently some 35 trailers uh, on a narrow, uh, shallow, slow moving body of water and adjacent to a provincially significant wetland. Um, there was to be a new sewage system. Because all the old trailers were to be removed, we asked that the trailer park be required to observe the setbacks in the bylaws of the 30 meters and to restore a shoreline buffer of 15 meters and to limit the number of trailers to what was in the LP, which at that time was 100. So we provided testimony from expert witnesses on lake capacity, on stormwater management, um, species at risk, and principles of planning. Um, and eventually it came down to a decision by the board, one lawyer, which didn't come until two years after the end of the hearing. And so using the legally non-complying provisions of the legislation um, with the old trailers as the justification, the board allowed these very large permanently situated three season trailers, or, or sorry, um, allowed these um, to, to replace the, uh, the trailers that had been there and at 15 meters from the water. And they, in the, their bylaws, they could be pretty close to each other. So a 16 meter wide lot. Um, at least they did lim limit the number of trailers uh, to 100. So what I have to say about that is there was very little of the science that we um, put before the board that, it, that had any serious consideration. And we had done um, a capacity study. There were two of them, one done by the, the, for the proponents of the trailer park and one uh, by ourselves. Um, unfortunately, the uh, proponents' were, capacity study was chosen even though it very much underestimated the level of development on the lake. So the lesson from that for me was that these are not battles that can be won lake by lake. Um, and I guess it was at this point that I, I tagged onto watersheds and um, decided, still, still pretty convinced that science has to be the basis of some of these decisions, that what we needed was a review of the published research on the significance of natural shorelines, especially with respect to runoff and um, impact on water quality. Watersheds and I, we, plan, we applied for a grant from the um, Lush um, Toiletries Company and uh, we got it. And uh, I'm forever grateful to them. And um, with that and money, federal money for a science graduate, we started the planning for our shorelines. Uh, shorelands. <clears throat> so can I have the next slide, please? So you've seen this picture. Um, we, uh, we collected a lot of science on shorelines. Uh, we wanted to, to have one paper and uh, to collect the best science available on the value of a natural shoreline, especially with respect to water quality, um, to describe what we actually meant by a natural shoreline and describe how to maintain and achieve natural shorelines. And so you've heard that part just from the previous uh, talk. Um, we wanted to put all of this together into one paper and a website, <clears throat> which can constantly evolve as new information becomes available. So there is a paper on the website now about um, the research that's been done on natural shorelines. Um, 
And if anyone listening to this um, has seen the paper, has something to add, has comments on how it could be made more effective, I would ask that you please send those comments to Watersheds Canada. We just wanted to make the strongest case we could for natural shorelines. Um, and it doesn't have to be lake specific, I think, because a lot of the principles from lakes from lake to lake are the same. And so that this would form the basis in case um, there is there one, then hopefully there are debates in the in future about why we need natural shorelines. We did it so that individual planners and municipalities are not placed in a position of trying to prove over and over again um, that what you do on the shorelines impacts water quality. And neither would they be placed in the position of trying to prove that one development um, will impact the whole lake. It's uh, my experience in that is it's not it's not possible. It's not a winner. Um, there has to be uh, acceptance, I think, of the position um, that it's the cumulative effect of development that makes the difference. And we wanted to place all to, so to send landowners so that they can understand why the purpose for the setbacks and buffers and, and where they can go for advice on improving their shorelines. So some of the lessons I had out of this, um, I think you can do the next slide. Um, it's a little dense, right? but anyway, um, well, definitely complicated scientific issues, I don't think um, benefit from hearings and especially not adjudicated by, um, not by people that don't understand the science. Um, scientifically, it's really hard to prove, if not impossible, that a single cottage or even a large development is going to have an impact on water quality. And I still, I feel science is still the base, but there has to be an acknowledgement generally, uh, supported by the sum of the best available data that a shoreline is important to water quality and it is the cumulative effects of development that count. Um, I also feel that some of the best um, um, successes in this whole area are, um, are achieved by engaging community. And that's what I have to say and thank you very much. Thank you, Janet, for uh, finding that important perspective of your uh, experience and um, lessons learned from working on implementing community shoreline projects. At this time, I'm going to welcome back uh, Robert Pye for a special announcement to be made by Watersheds Canada. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> I'll ask Janet to come back, please. Uh, Janet, you could bring back your camera there because you certainly need to be part of the special announcement. Um, your presentation was just excellent, Janet, and I think it really highlights um, um, the, the the importance of community engagement when it comes to uh, uh, freshwater protection. And that, uh, that message that you provided over the last 20 minutes or so is uh, what I've always gathered from not only you, but also uh, your late husband, Doug, um, for everybody's benefit, Doug Smith, um, was in palliative care uh, about this time last year, and he came to Watersheds Canada for uh, 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 an offer that that he had in mind. Uh, he wanted to present um, his story, his passion for lake stewardship, and uh, he uh, put together his story uh, and his uh, vision for uh, a healthy future for lakes and rivers in a video, and that video was actually filmed uh, in Ottawa on March 1st. And, um, at the time that Doug filmed, he was quite sick. Actually, he died two weeks later. Um, and, um, uh, uh, Janet was there that day and, and we, um, uh, got to, uh, capture Doug's passion for freshwater protection. That video is now on our YouTube site and I'll ask, uh, Conservation Ontario to provide the link. And please, it's, it's five and a half minutes of the most, uh, empowering, most inspirational, um, can do kind of spirit when it comes to everything we've been talking today with respect to lake stewardship. Um, when Doug left uh, that day after filming, uh, he presented a check, which became um, the uh, the first legacy gift that Watersheds Canada has received. And part of that legacy uh, uh, 
commitment involves this announcement that we're going to make today, uh, the first time ever. Um, I'm pleased to announce that through uh, Janet Taylor and Doug Smith, we're now in an opportunity to provide some support for lake associations in the terms of micro grants. And um, uh, coming soon, uh, stay tuned for full information, but we are in a position to, uh, thanks to Janet Taylor and Doug Smith, provide uh, a grants up to $500 to uh, about 15 community groups to uh, uh, present, provide the seed money for some local projects. And that could be uh, uh, perhaps bringing students out to help with uh, some shoreline restoration if, the, if that uh, seed money can provide uh, money for the uh, the you know for the drinks and uh, snacks, or if it could provide uh, money for vol volunteer groups to um, have uh, native plants access to shovels equipment. And we've had success. I know five hundred dollars doesn't sound like a lot, but it's it's just enough uh, with fifteen community groups to get people thinking about what what could we do with that first five hundred dollars? How could we raise more? And how could we make a day of it to get people really thinking about all the things we talked about today in this webinar? So uh, I am pleased to, to congratulate Janet uh, Taylor and uh, her late. Uh, husband Doug Smith on presenting Watersheds Canada with the uh, the responsibility to deliver these micro grants and again information will be available soon so uh, please join me in thanking Janet Taylor for that opportunity and if you are uh, attending and involved in the Lake Association and I noticed some people in the chat are talking about bio blitzes and opportunities to get volunteers out uh, consider this a way to uh, get that conversation started with your local club our local association. And, and now I just want to turn it over to Janet Taylor to speak to this uh, to this great funding announcement. Well, we've worked, uh, my husband Doug and I, we did work for a long time with, with watersheds. So we've enjoyed the work on the lake, even the, up, the ups and sometimes the downs. Um, but uh, we had a small experience of this kind of micro grant uh, earlier on with Watersheds Canada, and it was really successful. I really enjoyed looking at the proposals um, and all of them were, were really good. And I think um, it was amazing, the range and uh, the number of experiences that people were sharing. So, so um, yeah, I would urge you to give some thought to this. So thank you, Janet. And uh, I encourage everybody on the call and uh, anybody or anybody on the webinar and anybody that's uh, picking up this webinar um, as a post event kind of, uh, uh, preview that um, we should be uh, up and running soon with uh, an application process and a in a, a format to be able to review uh, opportunities to uh, provide these micro grants. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll turn it back over to Eric. Okay. Uh, thanks, Robert and Janet, for an exciting funding opportunity and the announcement. At this time, we'll start the uh, panelist portion of the uh, of the uh, webinar. Uh, again, if you have questions specifically, uh, please enter them in the Q and A, and we'll do our best to get to, get to them as many as we can. Uh, the first question: uh, How has Watersheds Canada collaborated with municipal decision makers to ensure the successful adoption and implementation of the toolkit's recommendations? If Robert or Chantel want to take that one. Uh, I'll take that, Eric. And if we could just get the question one more time. I'm sorry. Sure. How has Watersheds Canada collaborated with municipal decision makers to ensure the successful ad adoption and implementation of the toolkit's recommendations? Well, actually, I'm, Chantel, you've got some examples with South Frontenac, right? Yeah. So uh, the toolkits were actually designed uh, with help and guidance from South Frontenac Township, um, so as they are very involved in. Uh, lake ecosystem health. Um, so they provided insight to what a municipality and their residents need um, and the education uh, needed to create and maintain those healthy shorelands. So um, a lot of that like environmental net gain knowledge and and you know what the ideal resilient shoreland looks like was stuff that they believe that residents needed more education about to um, be healthy stewards of their land. So the rice was really valuable in creating the toolkit. So it was used to help municipal decision makers use this toolkit in the future, as well as the individuals of those residents in those municipalities as well. And then following kind of on, on the same theme, um, 
what can municipalities do to create more resilient shorelines or how can they encourage that? Yeah, so I saw it was uh, mentioned in the chat actually about uh, uh, tree and vegetation bylaws. So there are a few municipalities starting to do that nowadays. So um, uh, Janet had mentioned, you know, the setbacks and those have been uh, in our bylaws for a very long time. And there's, there's loopholes around those, but now municipalities are implanting these vegetation bylaws which regulates the removal of trees and alterations of uh, the grades, so of the, the actual shoreline itself. So the County of Halliburton just uh, actually earlier this year um, implemented that bylaw, uh, which limits, I think it was about 20 meters from the shoreline back, any removal of trees and other vegetation and the alteration of that grade uh, adjacent to any uh, waterfall, any waterway. So um, it's, a, it's very helpful, um, I find, where you can get around those loopholes in the development, whereas this is now a, a more permanent thing for redevelopment and new development. And um, I had talked about some with some landowners in that area, and they were obviously they were interested in natural edge, so they were very on board, and um, they had actually found the natural edge because of this bylaw. They saw that oh my my municipality has recognized the importance of this. Maybe I should as a landowner as well. So I think it's it's really important to get these municipalities on board as. They are the decision makers, as we are the this kind of science behind those decisions, and um, getting some bylaw in place is very effective. Another question that came in the chat: um, What are some of the common shoreline plants, and which plants are best suited for erosion control? Yeah, uh, that's my area of expertise. I'm kind of the the plant nerd here at Watersheds Canada, so. A uh, very common one that you see along shorelines um, and that we use a lot in our restoration practice is uh, the narrow leaf meadow sweet and uh, sweet gale, as well as dogwoods. All of those plants can handle those really wet soils and those fluctuating water levels. And they do a very really good job at absorbing that flood and, and being and any excess water and helping mitigate flood actions like that. So they're really good for right along that shoreline level. Um, and then as you move farther away from that shoreline up into your riparian upland zone, uh, other really common good plants for erosion control are like um, fragrant sumac. So not, not the staghorn sumac, the big ones you see on the row, but it's a smaller uh, sumac in a sumac family called fragrant sumac. Its root system is massive and almost net-like. So it's a really fantastic one for erosion control, especially when in, in com combination with trees. So I always like to say trees kind of have those big arms holding those soils together, holding in big chunks of soil. And then when you co use combination of shrubs with that, especially like fragrant sumac, chokeberry is also another great shrub for erosion in areas that aren't super wet as they help in with those smaller net light root systems hold that soil in place. So they are really effective at erosion control in drier areas where then you could have that meadow sweet or, or sweet gale or dogwoods in the more wet areas closer to the actual shoreline itself that helps with uh, uh, holding back any wake action and things that uh, would affect erosion from that way. Because when you have to look at erosion on a shoreline, you kind of have to look at the defending from the lake itself and from the terrestrial land as well and, and combining plants that work for erosion control in both those ways, but also as buffering capacity as well. So even though those, that fragrant sumac has a great uh, root system for erosion control, it also really helps with infiltration since there's so many pathways down those roots for water to get in um, and soak up that water from runoff. So many benefits to using native plants. The uh, next question we have, is there any experience in existing hardened shorelines with concrete deck and uh, shoreline boulders without removing the concrete, planting up among the top rock layer like a planting basket? Do you have any experience with that? Yeah, so we've done a, a few projects with uh, like deteriorating concrete walls. Um, typically, they're not removed. Uh, you just kind of plant behind them so that if they do, uh, when they eventually do break down and uh, and uh, fall apart, that those root systems are already in place. So I, I've worked on a few projects where those walls have pretty much already started to break down so that we started, we planted right behind them uh, with a heavy 
dense plantation of those erosion control kind of species uh, based on the sites they were at. And uh, I actually recently went back to that shoreline. It was done five or six years ago. And then I went back to it this this fall and you couldn't even tell that there was an old uh, retaining wall there. It was just a dense, lush, natural shoreline now, which has that erosion control of those roots as well as that retaining wall continues to degrade away. So we also recommend if you're doing uh, a hardened shoreline with like riprap, that if the riprap can be placed in such a way that is thin enough to plant within the riprap by able to being able to remove some rock and then plant within, that uh, really helps add that erosion control uh, aspect. So kind of teaming up with their the riprap and the nat natural shoreline. It also helps extend the life of that riprap as you know rock is continuing to remove. So kind of helps extend the life of a hardened shoreline as well. Uh, with having that native plant. So you can have the best of both worlds. Um, this is especially, we see this a lot happening on our bigger lakes, such as Lake Ontario, where, you know, the wave action is a huge issue. So sometimes those places do need some more uh, hardened shoreline help for erosion control. So we, then we can plant within that riprap and to have the best of both worlds there. Just similar question to the last question. This one is specifically to Lake Ontario. Uh, any experience uh, for uh, projects or sites where there's large armor stone or significant volumes of riprap? Uh, can you comment how the natural edge can be implemented in these areas where you have limited backshore or table end space? Gotcha. Um, again, it's, it's more kind of planting right behind that with as a dense planting. Um, so it, it depends on when I go to a site, it kind of depends what the landowner's needs are. So if it is for growth control behind those hardened armored, hardened armored stone walls or dense riprap, um, planting behind that is kind of the option for that now. Um, I have done a site where we were actually able to plant in front of the armor stone as there's a lot of fluctuating water on that lake. So it really depends on lake to lake. Lake Ontario, that doesn't quite have that option as it's normally either this year it seems a little low but it normally seems to be always high on Lake Ontario um so the, the best option is to plant behind it and within any of that rip wrap if it is rip wrap if possible so I know it can get pretty dense especially in Lake Ontario where you need that that more hardened shoreline um but planting behind it definitely helps in, in terms of like flood mitigation and any high water levels because you'll see that uh, we do get a, a bigger flooding event like we did in 2019 and 2017, that it was probably going to go above that that riprap or armored wall stone, potentially, depending on how it is, so that you can have protection for behind that wall as well. Are there plans to expand the toolkit or develop additional resources in the future, considering evolving environmental challenges and changes in our legislation that impact shoreline protection? I'll send that over to Robert. The, the answer is yes. We we want to expand it. We've just we've just gotten started, quite frankly, on the planning for a shoreland um, menu, so to speak, of of toolkits and options. Uh, there's a couple of things that have happened though. Um, in in the past year, we've we've everybody in Ontario has been riding the the media roller coaster around uh, the more homes built faster act. We've gone from um, you know, the proposed elimination of site plan control, the no, no, that's reversed to um, a few other uh, changes. But uh, despite it all, um, a focus on um, on on shoreland uh, restoration in, in spite of uh, a lot of people now have the opportunity, of course, we didn't bring this up yet, but a lot of people have the opportunity now to work from home. So that uh, that idea of, of turning the cottage into a permanent home uh, that's, that's, wasn't just a fad that will, that will keep, keep going strong. And, and with that comes all the challenges. So, uh, we are, uh, really grassroots. We've got our, 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 you know, our ear to the community and we want to know what are the challenges, what are the gaps that are coming through. So there's enough people, enough expertise, uh, on, on this webinar to help us, um, help the entire, uh, waterfront community, including, uh, municipal, uh, uh, locally elected officials and it was about this time last year as well that we saw a lot of municipalities with 
uh, fresh faces, fresh ideas, but also fresh faces, new uh, new council members elected in uh, Watersheds Canada is prepared to do our part to uh, to attend as many council meetings as we can possibly get out to with information to uh, to, to start the communications and deliver the, the, the resources that we have. But we want to keep adding to it. Um, right now, we're uh, we're we're all ears, and and we will take advice and um, uh, on on what could be missing. It could be uh, a, as simple as some social media uh, series, or it could be uh, really involved with a, a workbook. And um, we're we're a resourceful organization. We have, as you uh, heard from Janet uh, Taylor, uh, we have the opportunities to uh, reach out to people who are willing to provide the funding support to get us to this point um, for all the right reasons. So uh, the answer is yes, we want to keep growing the program. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Building on that last, last question, uh, another question is, uh, has Watersheds Canada thought to uh, expand uh, beyond inland, inland lakes to address situations along the Great Lakes, including specific hazards uh, related to that, like uh, dynamic beach for example are you looking to go to move beyond the inland lakes to great lakes or is any work or is that in the stuff to be done in the future um yeah we're we are in expansion mode um actually we're uh in expansion mode just on, uh, through ontario's inland lakes but also across canada um, we're uh, expanding our natural edge program and taking these uh, resources and the, the toolkits nationwide. Uh, we are already working on Great Lakes, uh, particularly Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence Seaway. And uh, I really need to pass that back over to Chantel because she's the one that's really been uh, uh, shovels in the ground with volunteers. And, and I'll just say before I pass along to Chantel that uh, we are in a good position to uh, to take our programs and our expertise to uh, the other Great Lakes that are also uh, experiencing blue-green algae, uh, 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 erosion uh, issues through, uh, of course, impacts of climate change, severe storms and so on. So uh, yeah, we're ready. We're ready to move, but I'll turn it back over to Chantel to provide the base of what's been happening on uh, Lake Ontario in particular. Yeah, so we have, uh, it has many sh uh, shovels in the ground, as Robert said, and, and the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway, including uh, four big uh, demo projects that uh, planted about 3,000 to 4,000 tree shrubs and wildflowers just along uh, Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, this fall alone, actually, we did a lot of work along uh, Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence, all the way down to Cornwall and the, the area of concern within the Cornwall Aquasosny area. Um, but we have uh, landowners interested in, in our area and the, the Cataraqui watershed. Uh, along Lake Ontario there as well. And then we also have our partner, Quinty Conservation, who uh, does the program throughout the Bay of Quinty, uh, along the shores of Prince Edward and, and along the, the Bay of Quinty as well. We also have partners up in uh, Thunder Bay that does some work on the, the Great Lakes up there, but they do mostly inland lakes and uh, streams as well. But uh, yeah, we're looking for more partners who are interested in working on the Great Lakes and using our tools and our resources. And, and that's what they were designed for. They were designed for sharing and, and getting this information and resources out there so anyone can participate, including uh, people uh, promoting the program, using the program, and just being a participant in the program. It's all designed for them in mind and, and, and a way to share that as well. I think this next question might be for Janet. Uh, any tips, Janet, or things to consider for anyone looking to buy a waterfront property that you can share? Um, well, <laughs> I'm not sure. There's not a. There's no. Uh, I don't think comparative study of lakes and uh, uh, this sort of thing. But um, yeah, I, I guess a little research on um, how development uh, occurs on the lake might be helpful. Um, but really, I don't have a lot of tips for that. Um, um, you know, there are all, are all the different kinds of lakes, like the shallow lakes that, that are a lot of wetland that are ours, that are very productive. And there are the deep water lakes, which sometimes get a little more protection because of the, uh, the trout. Um, but on the whole, I think it's just a very personal choice. 
I'll add on to that. I would say, yeah, uh, look into if there, if there is a lake association on that lake is, um, they would provide a lot of information about the lake itself and can help you make your decision making about if that's the right lake for you, rather if you like to fish a lot. And, and as Janet mentioned, a deep water lake that may have those, that walleye that you like to fish and, and a lake association that may also help promote um, the habitat for that as well. So looking into that kind of stuff and the science behind that lake can be helpful. And a lake association has that local knowledge and we love to utilize that local knowledge as well in our programs and doing walleye rehabilitation beds and things like that. Thanks. Another question we have is uh, someone works for SEA along Lake Erie and gets questions all the time about what to plant on lakefront properties. Uh, is there a way that CAs can send landowners to your organization or are there resources that you could uh, direct people to? Yeah, so uh, we do not have Lake Erie. I don't believe we have off the top of my head a partner in that area currently that can actually get on the ground and help them out. But their biggest resource would be the uh, one of the resources I talked about in my presentation, the Guide to Preparing Shoreline Naturalization or something along that line is a long title that uh, helps a landowner walk through how to do our naturalization project, which then links them to our nat native plant database. And that's where you'd be able to find what plants to plant there um, based on the conditions you can put in. So you can sort, you can filter out the list to, you know, my shoreline's really wet or my shoreline's really dry and gets a lot of sun. So you can put those conditions in and it will recommend plants uh, for your shoreline basically and then you can scroll through and pick ones out that you find visually appealing or if you read into more information about them if you think for sure they'll work for your shoreline um, and that will, and using that uh, shoreline naturalization guide will help you walk through that as well so you can choose the best plants but definitely our native plant database would be a, a very good resource for them to try to choose plants they can um, uh, can use for their shoreline and then if they uh if they want to reach out to us, we can always I provide information virtually whenever possible, since we can't get out to every shoreline. Um, so if people can like they can send me, you know, their shoreline characteristics and I can try to help them uh, with uh, suggesting some plants that may help, as well as maybe some local areas where they can actually purchase those plants, because that can be challenging at times as well as finding those native plants as well. So you may find, oh, I love this alternate leaf dogwood, but I can't find it in, in my local uh Canadian Tire Garden Center, right? So, um, so you can find those local native nurseries that I we source them as well, but perhaps they're local to their area. Great. Uh, how user friendly is the toolkit for individuals who may not have a strong background in either science or uh, environmental policy? And take that on. Um, it's a uh, very user friendly. Like, like I said earlier, it was designed uh, for those residents of the municipal municipalities. So it's designed for all individuals. Um, it's written in non science language. Um, basically, we took the science and we we condensed it into information that is easily absorbable and um, is in a language level that anyone can understand. Um, so the tools are easy to understand and, and provides lots of options on how to tackle the issues that, you know, the science has identified. And now these are tools that can combat those issues. So it was designed with that in mind when um, creating these tools in the toolkit. Okay, and we have another question. How does someone become a delivery partner with Watersheds Canada? Uh, you can just reach out to me at uh, naturaledge at watersheds.ca and I'll, uh, we'll put you in touch with the Natural Edge uh, manager and we can, uh, uh, we'll set up an initial meeting uh, to talk about um, what you're looking for and how, what we can provide you as well. So we're open to any other people reaching out and if you're interested in becoming a builder partner, now's the time to do it as well as we are, as Robert mentioned, in the expansion mode right now and, and, and we're trying to get in some more partners so we can get this knowledge out to all waterfront property owners. And how can individuals or organizations contribute to the development and improvement of the toolkit? Uh, if you have any um, questions or anything you want to add into the toolkit, 
uh, you can reach out to uh, Watersheds uh, info at Watersheds. Uh, I hope Monica will put that in the chat. And then that can be, uh, that's our main email and that can be sent to the people working on these toolkits. So if you have any ideas of ways to improve the toolkit or things to add in, that can be sent there. I don't know if Robert has anything else to add to that. You did a great job, Chantel. Thanks. I was just going to add as well that uh, I think it was Janet that mentioned like she used White Lake as as her case study, but it doesn't have to be lake specific. Uh, if you get uh, 10 lake association uh, members in one room, you generally find there's a uh, commonality with, with the issues that they are experiencing and, and ways to support each other. And that's exactly why uh, Watersheds Canada, along with uh, uh, support from some conservation authorities and FOCA uh, provide the annual Lake Links uh, uh, workshop that's held. It was actually held for the first time since COVID uh, in person in Perth uh, last last October. So, anyways, uh, Monica's put the uh, the link for our mailing list, and and that Lake Links uh, workshop, supported by conservation authorities and Watersheds Canada and FOCA and other partners, is a, a, a place to uh, network and share these ideas and put ideas on the table, as well as gives us our ideas what can be put into future toolkits. So thank you for the question. Uh, would Watersheds Canada be uh, open to expanding the manual to include uh, policy specifics for dynamic beaches, especially with the large fluctuations in water levels on the Great Lakes and Ottawa River in the past few years? We, yeah, that's a great, we, we've started on um, uh, bringing together, we've been reviewing the policies across municipalities. Um, it hasn't included uh, specifics on beaches, although I see that as an opportunity. So um, note taken, uh, we've been looking at policies with respect to shoreline protection bylaws and so on. Um, but uh, uh, the beach uh, element is is certainly something we can look at. So um, I will have a discussion. <laughs> Another question for Janet. Janet, how do you keep motivated despite encountering roadblocks and obstacles? Well, that is a challenge. Um, I did call, kind of fall by the wayside for a year or two, um, um, especially after this OMB hearing. But uh, um, I, I think, well, Watersheds has been very inspiring and very helpful at, at keeping me going. And, and it's still something I'm passionate about uh, after all these years. So. Uh, every now and then have to take a bit of a break. Um, and also there's been so much positive. I mean, I has, think I have a tendency sometimes to uh, to focus on the negative, but really um, there, just from what you've heard at this, this talk, there is a lot of positive. So that keeps me going. And so I have to keep looking at that side, even though things keep happening like yesterday in Ottawa, um, there's a lot of good stuff happening. So just keep focusing on that. A uh, question for Robert or Chantel. Uh, you mentioned that you work with municipalities and community groups for uh, demonstration sites. What are some of those and how do those typically happen? Good question. Uh, so some of those we did those fall include uh, more stored waterfront park, uh, Gananoque Marina on Bay Road, um, Maitland Tower was another demo site we did as well as uh, Lamaru Park in in Cornwall. And we did, a, and, and St. Lawrence College in Cornwall. So we did many demo sites. Those involved normally volunteers um, and large quantities of plants as, um, you know, they're large areas. Um, they kind of happen in a variety of different ways, normally with partnering with uh, more local uh, organizations. So for example, for Morrisburg Park, they have a Morrisburg environmental um, committee or uh, an organization focused just on uh, the park itself. So they were a really great resource that had already had that volunteer base and the local knowledge with their uh, local municipality uh, to get the project on board. So we really utilize those those local organizations and those grassroots organizations um, to help get those projects moving. 
And in fact, we, especially in Norrisburg, we really got the municipality on board and uh, the first, we've done two plantings there now to continue expanding that uh, buffer zone. And last year, there's actually the, the new mayor came out. Um, and so we had, you know, politics right digging in the ground with us. So it's a really great opportunity to get the municipality involved, you know, local owners and people who use the park daily that came and helped out and and this spring we had about 50 people there helping us plant over around around 300 native uh, trees shrubs and wildflowers um, so it was a great community event sometimes they're smaller and sometimes we get schools involved so uh, in terms of the Lamaru Park and the St. Lawrence College we had a whole class come out and help us plant about 1500 trees and shrubs in a, uh, in a meadow area adjacent to uh, the St. Lawrence River and a salmon uh, breeding stream. Um, so that was how that was conducted with, again, another partnership and uh, with the, the St. Lawrence College and the St. Lawrence River Institute as well. So it's really those partnerships and that collaboration that helps get these projects on board. And that's kind of the base of Watersheds Canada, as I mentioned, you know, partnering, sharing knowledge and sharing resources is uh, important to us. And I think it, it gets the job done. And are you seeking more uh, locations to complete uh, more stewardship projects on and they're typically are they private or public lands? Yeah, so both like the project in our delivery areas continue to to uh, get more people on board. Um, so um, our project area is kind of north of Perth, the Kingston uh, down towards Cornwall area. But we have delivery partners elsewhere. So, you know, you can send us all your interested sites and we can see if we have funding for those sites currently or if we can find funding later on if there are bigger sites. Um, so, yeah, we're definitely interested in adding in more naturalization sites uh, and adding more to our, uh, our ongoing spread list and our ongoing numbers. So any any opportunities you have, please send them our way and we'll see if it's uh, possible. question is for Robert. Um, what do your presentations to councils look like? What is the feedback or action or response been uh, from politicians after you present? Uh, thank you. Um, it's uh, it's been a pleasure actually to speak with uh, councils. I've I've personally done uh, a number of them since uh, spring of this year. Um, Usually it's uh, it's what you can bottle up in about five minutes because that's usually all that you get for a, a, a delegation. Um, and uh, but the response has been really strong. Like um, um, we found that in some cases uh, the audience members actually consist of lake associations leaders who are at council meeting um, to uh, talk about issues. And it turns out that. Uh, Watersheds Canada timing at the uh, council meeting that night was just perfect. So uh, not only that, a lot of councillors, in fact, live on the lake and they see the issues themselves. So to have uh, uh, a national organization like Watersheds Canada speak in just five minutes uh, so passionately uh, with a scientific uh, background and appreciation for the volunteer uh, 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 movement in their community it really it really is encouraging for counselors and the, it provides a base going forward uh some of the presentations we've provided there's in fact not necessarily been an issue in the municipality it's merely proactive and and setting the the right tone and setting the right message so there's a lot that watersheds canada can deliver if we get the opportunity to speak to your council in just five minutes and then it creates uh, some dialogue. Even with uh, uh, Kingston, we had a situation where counselors followed up and were asking what they can do uh, in, in future events and where can they be there to support us with demo sites. So as Chantel mentioned, we've even had uh, mayors and uh, you know other elected officials, counselors show up at our events uh, for all the right reasons to participate because they like what we're doing. Great, great. I guess we have uh, one more question. Is the app available for the public to download or how is it uh, accessed? Yeah, so the app is available to our delivery partners as it does require a login and uh, some setup as it uh, involves, you know, you have to put in your um, 
your pay structure as well. So uh, depending on what funding you have, all that kind of thing. So it is specific to delivery partners, uh, to that partner specific. So it does require a login and some more setup. So that's only the one resource that I've mentioned that is not available freely on our website as it does requires, you know, some back end work to get you into that app as it is a, a little more complicated app than just the, the video game I described. So um, that's the only thing is just, you know, reach out to us. And if you're interested in becoming our partner, we can provide you more information uh, to get you on board and access to the app if you're interested. But everything else is available online, including the native plant database, which is hugely helpful uh, if you're doing, like you're using the guideline or just looking for plants for your shoreline. Great, thanks. I don't see many other questions appearing. Um, any final comments from Robert or Janet or um, yourself, Chantel? Just want to say uh, thank you to Chantel and uh, Janet for uh, uh, delivering um, just a great overview of all these uh, toolkits and, and opportunities that are available for uh, Lakeshore residents and uh, professionals uh, that uh, share our interest in lake protection through shoreline natural naturalization. Uh, everybody's doing a great job and keep up the good work. Thank you. Yeah, on behalf of the uh, Laternal uh, Steering Committee, uh, thank you uh, to the panelists and the speakers today for sharing your knowledge and experience and the policy toolkit that you guys created to create uh, sustainable development along our shorelines. Uh, the webinar was brought to you by the Laternal Symposium Steering Committee. I'd like to thank those who helped to make this happen, including Katrina Fiorletto from uh, Cataraque Conservation, Nikisha Mohammed from Conservation Ontario, and Miriam Mallet from Alsa Inc., who are part of the planning committee for this webinar. If you missed any of our previous webinars, you can review the recordings at laternal.ca and the recording for this webinar should be posted within a few days. And one more thing uh, before you uh, before you leave, if you have any feedback on our webinar series, uh, please take a minute to complete some of the final poll questions. Thank you everyone. Have a great day. <laughs>